everyone. It's nice to see so many faces that I know. Oh, those are not my notes. All right. I have no notes. So um, <laughs> this is a topic that I can do in my sleep, um, and particularly after working with so many of the communities around um, Central Kentucky. Probably many of you have heard this to some extent um, in the past. So my goal today uh, is to give you a little bit of a 10,000 foot overview and to talk about some of the key um, information pieces that communities need to explore when we start talking about land use decisions. Um, so next slide. So one of the things um, that, you know, I do economic development across the state. Um, I train economic developers, all of our economic developers um, in the state go through training that we lead. Um, and one of the most important key takeaways that we talk about in economic development is the need for a diverse economy. And one of the most amazing things about this region, um, and I will continuously say region, because I refuse to do anything by the county, um, because it really limits um, how we think. But one of the great things about Central Kentucky is that we are incredibly diverse. And in places that have kind of put all their eggs in one basket, when that industry faces challenges, obstacles, declines, what have you, um, they suffer. Um, and Lexington is in a position, Lexington MSA, is in a position that they can withstand um, any type of, for the most part, any type of industry loss. And so one of the best examples is sort of the transition from Lexmark going, you know, it has seen continuous decline as time has gone on and ownership changes. Um, but this region has been able to withstand what was an incredibly important part of that regional economy. So this pie chart doesn't really matter what those different pie slices are. What's amazing is how colorful it is, right? And so we should be extremely thankful and proud and continue um, that tradition of being diverse because it allows us to do what we can do. So um, one of the, and I know uh, Ryan will be here afterwards talking about the economic importance of agriculture, um, but in this particular region, when we look at on-farm production, which is how agriculture is typically measured, it is a pretty small chunk of the overall economy, if you just look at on-farm. So if you look here, it's that little light blue slice at the tippy top. Um, it's not huge, but what we have um, taken great pains to measure is sort of looking at what are all of the contributing sectors, businesses um, that overall make um, the region a huge agricultural cluster. Um, and so, go to the next slide, I don't think I talked about it quite yet. But before I do that, um, one of the important pieces um, that I ask folks um, to think about when they um, try before land use decisions is what is your agricultural sector? How do you measure? What are you including? Um, how are you measuring overall impact? And this was a study um, we just updated for the state um, a couple weeks ago, actually, using the most current data that we can have, which is really going line item by line item of what are the agricultural sectors, what's employment, what's value added, um, so that we have an understanding of how that, what that measure is, and how it relates to the overall economy. If you look um, right underneath Andrea's head, um, <laughs> you will see um, this 5.4%, the 6.7%, the 4.8%, that is agricultural's um, ratio, that's the portion of the overall economy. And some people say, oh, that's fairly small. But again, remember, we want to be diverse. If agricultural's ratio, you know, if we had 90% of the economy was ag, we would be in deep trouble, right? If there's something, and we know that ag is very cyclical, um, we want to make sure, again, that none of our industries is a huge chunk of the overall economy. But when we measure it this way, and you'll see at the top we've got agricultural production, and we've got some processing, and we've got some inputs, it's still a fairly small, um, but an important part of the overall economy. If you go to the next slide, um, when we did this in, this was just for Fayette County, this is some work we do at Fayette Alliance, um, when we really started to say, what, what is our cluster? What is the agricultural cluster? And of course, you know, in central Kentucky, it immediately goes to the horses. 
um, and it goes to cattle, right? We, we have to constantly remind folks that we are a huge cattle industry. But in and of itself, that's important. But what's even more important are all of the businesses that contribute to that sector. And so we have tried, um, and this dated back to, I think about 2012, when we first started doing this over the course of a holiday break, going through you know the digital yellow pages to identify every single business that 100% was part of the agricultural cluster. So when we start talking about Haggard and some of, you know, and, and this amazing role class that, you know, veterinarian and, um, and Root and Riddle, that's big, right? That's important. But we're talking about all kinds of other <clears throat> businesses that we may not think about, whether they're pharmaceuticals, whether they're accounting, whether they are legal, and really try to say, if in fact, our overall economy shifted in a way that our and our land use pattern shifted in a way that we've lost a significant share of our agricultural sector, we would expect these industries to disappear. Root and Riddle and the Haggard are here because they are close in proximity to the horse capital of the world. The horse capital of the world disappears, so will those two world class There are other places in the country where they have you know smaller components and that's where they would redirect the resources. So if we just say, oh, we lose a farm, you know, it's a loss of a farm, it's tragic, but we're talking about these other sectors that are really important, high paying jobs, very local, um, really important to our local economy. So in this document, and I know I saw it in the back of the resource page, um, and we try to update this on a fairly regular basis, you can see all of, um, the businesses or types of businesses that were 100% dedicated to agriculture. And I know if you know Brittany and you know Fate Alliance, you'll hear the term one in 12 jobs. And that is true, one in 12 jobs within, this, uh, within Fayette County are related to the agricultural cluster. That doesn't mean they're all on farm, but it means that they are contributing to that overall cluster. So we have produced this document um, as a way to highlight have people think more about, you know, broader about what ag means for this region beyond just thinking about our beautiful horse farms. Um, one of the things that um, are not included in this uh, particular slide is uh, back in 2012, we did interviews with um, a group of industry leaders outside of agriculture within the region and asked them, you know, what is what's important about this rural landscape? Is it important to you in, in the work that you do? And not surprisingly, but important to document what these folks said, it is incredibly important um, because this landscape is a way to recruit and retain our top professionals. You know, and you all know this, when you come off, you know, come flying into Bluegrass Airport, you know, these folks don't go to their place of work to meet people first. They get taken on that tour to go see what Central Kentucky is all about. I am one of those people, I came from Reno, Nevada, um, which is extremely brown, and the tumbleweeds literally do go across the street. Um, and I flew into Lexington, and I'm from the East Coast, so I'm familiar with grass. But I flew in <laughs> to Bluegrass Airport, and the decision was made. I had zero intention of ever moving to the University of Kentucky. The decision was made upon it, because I thought, this is so absolutely beautiful. I had a colleague, um, one of my staff who I brought in, and I knew this was a kind of crazy position for him, and I knew it was a small chance of getting him. And I took him off Old Frankfort Pike, and took him on a, I almost killed him, but it was, <laughs> it was dark, and, you know, it was dark, and it, those are hilly areas, but really it's a, it is a landscape that's incredibly important for industries outside of agriculture. So we did document what they thought were some really, how that, how the ag sector um, and how our overall kind of rural landscape in a city field is incredibly important. Um, we also do try to highlight that if there is a loss in agriculture, that the sectors that are impacted are not just within agriculture. And one of the things that we were not able to capture, so our, our estimates were conservative, were those um, sectors where not 100% of their work was dedicated to agriculture. So they may be um, a legal firm or they may be an accountant uh, firm where some of their staff are dedicated to ag, but not all, those folks were not included. 
And so it's important to know, you know, what are the other types of services and industries that would be impacted? All right, next slide. So one of the things, and this is, I can tell you that um, in the last two years, I guess I was surprised, and it all started with, um, in Bourbon County, um, I was just suddenly shocked, um, although I shouldn't have been, that housing is now the number one economic development issue, which is not unrelated to our workforce development issue. Um, and so housing has become essentially all that I do. Um, I was leading a national webinar yesterday on rural housing. And we have somehow, um, just in our daily you know, work, focused on economic development, focused on workforce development, um, suddenly have a gigantic crisis that does not have an easy way out. And we are suddenly thinking, oh, we want to bring industry. Where? I mean, if, even if we have the land, where are these people going to live? Um, and so we have started working with a number of um, communities across the state, helping them understand you know, what is their future housing demand. And in order to do that, they need to have a better understanding of what housing they have right now. And so we started doing this first in Bourbon County, where they were experiencing some great opportunities for economic development, but there was very little um, available quality stock in the community. And so the question is, what do we need? Where do we need it? And what type of stock is it? And um, no matter where I've been, um, and this is a great concern, particularly for this conversation today, is the absolute mismatch in our current stock of housing and our current household. Our households are getting smaller. Um, and what folks want, and this always makes me feel so absolutely hypocritical, um, it's what folks want is a single family house on an acre of land, but they don't want our farmland or our rural <laughs> landscape to be changed. So I am yeah, the absolute hypocrite. I live in a giant house I have no business in because it's affordable. We live in a region where housing is extremely affordable, particularly when I moved from Reno. Um, and I live on an acre of land, and I have my husband and I and 85 dogs, and each dog literally has their own room, and it used to be an old farm. And so you're just like, how do you change the culture of folks as they think about housing? How do you, we have folks who are in the wrong home, who started in their starter house, they had their family, the family's gone on to college, and they're still in their starter house. And so now you have all these families that are looking for starter houses within their income range and they can't find it. And so part of it is understanding the data, understanding the, the quality of stock that you have, understanding where developments can occur, understanding what existing stock you can renovate, building up, not out. Um, but a lot of it is understanding the preferences of the folks who are looking for housing um, and how you can shift that thinking. How can you, we have no earthly way to have everyone in a single family home on an acre of land in this country. You would need another country to be able to go and have that and be able to meet that demand. And I think what's kind of exciting is the generation that is now in that early family stage actually is looking for a different stock of house. Um, my daughter is in a, she owns a farm in, in Lee County and she lives in a teeny home um, she lived in a trailer house that got washed away in the flood. And then as opposed to saying, oh, I want to have a strong foundation, she went and she got a teeny home because she does not want a lot of space to have to take care of. She did not want to take on any debt. And so that was what she has. So housing to me, if I were to take anything away from today's conversation, is this is a critical, critical um, issue. Um, it is completely contradictory to kind of the but keeping land, you know, in our rural landscape, how do we, how are we going to deal with this? This is really, 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 really big. And so we have, um, we have some data on, on our website for every county that helps you think about who is living in our community, um, how do we have folks age in place, um, and then uh, what is the mismatch right now between the stock of housing we have at that current price and the incomes of the people who live here. So I think by now everyone's heard of the missing middle. We have a huge gap of housing for folks who are middle income, low to middle income. Our school teachers, 
from nurses, um, anyone who's making that thirty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year. That's, that was a forgotten group when we started building. That's the type of group that likes that their best match for housing is townhomes, duplexes, high rises, um, and we don't have that. And so that is, if I were again, if I were to take anything out of today's conversation, it is the absolute need to think about housing in this discussion, which I know in this region is a very hot topic. Um, next slide. I think this is it for me. That's it. So um, I will, and I'm happy to entertain other questions. Most of you know me as the economic impact person. Um, uh, Commissioner Carls will come in and talk a little bit about the economic value of agriculture. Our numbers don't always match um, based on our um, processes, but it is um, something that I'm happy to work with communities in. Um, solar, um, for those who know me now, um, I've been the solar queen for the last 18 months, working in communities to think about how do we do this, um, what are some really critical questions both individual farmers need to consider and communities need to consider as we go into this very kind of financially lucrative offerings for landowners. This has become, uh, for years, it's all I did. I was the traveling solar roadshow. Um, and so it's not just a central Kentucky issue. It is all over, but yes, Clark County, Mason County, uh, Harding County, um, that's where I spent a lot of time and, and continue to do so. So happy to answer questions and then turn it over. So just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I've been in Kentucky about 15 years. Um, I'm a native of Saratoga, New York, up in upstate New York. We've got a few connections here. Um, went to school for business and continued on for a uh, master's in urban planning. Um, I started off my planning career in academia. I worked for the Center for Environmental Policy Management, um, headed by Lauren Heberly over at U of L. A lot of the work that I did early on was related to uh, hazard mitigation, so both natural hazards and man-made hazards as well. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and some of the issues that Bourbon County faces with particularly flooding. Um, and I went on to do some work with brownfields um, remediation on a uh, technical assistance level. So we had participated in EPA Region 4 um, programs on uh, educating and giving assistance to local communities about brownfield remediation and uh, to add a slightly unrelated but similar organic recovery. So. Um, so that's kind of my uh, background before getting to Bourbon County. I've been in Bourbon County for six years now. Uh, I consider myself a Parisian at this point. Um, <laughs> it is my home. I am a small town girl and, uh, and it is a small town community, very tight knit. Um, so a lot of the examples I'm going to share with you are, are part of those experiences of community <coughs> engagement and um, in development of our comprehensive plan, as well as the housing study and many other projects that our community has engaged in in the past six years. Um, my role at Bourbon County as a planning administrator uh, started six years ago. I am the first uh, plan full-time planner in Bourbon County, so it took them a little while to make that investment in a planning office. Um, Unfortunately for communities that don't have the resources or have chosen not to invest in planning, um, it's obviously you all know as preservationists and conservationists that uh, planning is one of the most important tools that we have to ensuring that uh, growth happens in a smart manner. Um, so during my time there, my first task was to take on the comprehensive plan and to start looking at long range planning for the Bourbon County community. Um, on the slide here, you see that it shows a nice gravel road with some fencing. Over 90% of our land is used for agriculture, whether it be uh, you know, cattle, produce, and related crops, and uh, horse, the horse industry as well. Um, However, we do have an urban core with tremendous opportunity for infill and adaptive reuse. So one of the key you know, parts of uh, bluegrass tomorrow's 
you know, mission in the Regional Land Use Partnership is the focus on infill development. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about that and what we've done in Bourbon County. Um, however, you can't, uh, you know, discount the fact that agriculture has had both um, uh, positive and uh, negative effects on the community, so to speak, in the aspect of historical um, farm labor. Uh, originally, obviously, slave labor was used on many of our farms in Bourbon County. Um, our population of African American was over 50% at one point. Um, and at the time of emancipation, uh, there were uh, explicitly designated areas of Paris that were just for the black community. That still exists very much today. Now, while our African American population has decreased, now is just close to 6% of the population in Bourbon County, our Latino population is increasing. Um, and that's one of the things that we're very prideful of is the diversity in Bourbon County. So if there's one thing that you take away, and obviously Allison brought it up from an economic standpoint, diversity both from a racial standpoint, from a workforce standpoint, from diversity in housing stock, these are all really important things to embrace. Um, but getting back to that segregated community, some of the issues that we are grappling with in Bourbon County have to do with that aspect of segregation and the disproportionate um, the, the population that has suffered over generations. And I bring this up to you not to talk negatively about Bourbon County because we are not unique in that aspect. There are towns and cities all over the country that are experiencing the same things, but the righting these wrongs are tremendous opportunities for our community um, to grow, but from the inside. Right, so grow on those areas that can be reutilized. Um, these are all stories that hadn't been really told before. There hadn't been a voice for the community. And until we started having extensive community meetings to talk about what the priorities of our community were, we, didn't, we weren't hearing from that what we call silent majority, right? We have the we have the uh, vocal minority that shows up at meeting after meeting, and they have the same uh, agenda that they're pushing. Um, and really, community engagement is about diversification in the voices that we're hearing. So we did a variety of different activities. And we didn't reinvent the wheel on anything. Anybody here from Lexington can know that we um, pretty much hacked everything, you know, on the table activity. We did the on the table in Murray County. Um, and we really didn't try to reinvent the wheel, but we went out around the community and we went out to the churches and said, hey, here's a package. We want you to talk about what your issues are and report back to us. Um, we had community events. We have the Art Walk in Paris every year and we have the Chautauqua in Millersburg and a variety of other events that we set up um, a chalk and talk. Cedic does this activity at UK, um, Ryan Sandwick, I think he had um, started this and it really is just a three-sided chalkboard that you set up at an event and you pose questions on it. And so people from all ages, even kids, they might draw a picture, um, but you know, adults too can talk about uh, one question was, our next generation needs this. And so it's a way of um, identifying what the priorities of the community were. Some other questions were, uh, one of my favorite things about Bourbon County is this. So as you can see, one of the most popular answers was uh, it, it, to package it up natural resources. So somebody might have put uh, the park somebody might have put uh, the farms, uh, horses, uh, a variety of different things. So we learned that one of the biggest priorities of the community at all ages were natural resources. For Bourbon County, it was also community facilities, 
um, the local businesses, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the hyper-local approaches that we've taken in Bourbon County um, to trying to shift that cultural mindset and that connection to the outdoors. Um, and some of the challenges, obviously housing was one of those big challenges. Um, for those of you uh, that are not aware of Bourbon County, we are an anomaly in the adjacent counties to uh, Fayette and the fact that we have not grown in 100 years. <laughs> Our um, population has remained 20,000 for over 100 years. <laughs> yeah. And um, the city of Paris is about 10,000. Um, Millersburg is close to 500. And uh, North Middletown is about 300. And a lot of that is intentional. Um, Bourbon County does not have an urban growth boundary a defined urban growth boundary, but we do have some of the most acres in privately conserved land in the entire state. And Claiborne Farm is in, er, is essentially our urban growth boundary. Um, the street, I, I actually back up my house to Claiborne Farm, but I am a quarter mile from Main Street. So it is both, kind of the best of both worlds, an urban environment, but if you and all you have to do is walk right down from Main Street and you're, you're at horses. Um, so that is one of the aspects of Bourbon County that although our community has not uh, made the policy choice to adopt an urban growth boundary, um, our landowners have already defined that for us in a sense. Um, as you know, Bourbon County also has the Paris Pike Corridor which um, one of the things, if you ask our community members, um, you know, what you would like, what they would like for Bourbon County, oftentimes they can tell you what, what they don't want to be like. They don't want to be another Nicholasville Road. They don't, you know, they don't want to be a sprawling corridor between Lexington and the next community. So we have obviously made a very, um, very concerted, there's been a very concerted effort over the years um, through much litigation, <laughs> those of you that have been here through that experience um, as to why Paris Pike is what it is today. Um, and likewise, in Bourbon County, we have growth areas out in the county. So these are areas where residential development can occur, but it's in a node. So, Therefore, we're not going to have um, subdivisions popping up all throughout the county. There are very defined areas for that type of growth to occur. Um, but, I, and I'm kind of, I'm not as uh, structured as Allison with my slides, but, um, uh, but as far as the, uh, you know, Rob was talking about mapping out doing a regional map to show um, different aspects of land development patterns. If we talk about land development in Bourbon County, um, even though I can tell you, no, we have not grown in the past 100 years, that our development patterns have been not sustainable, not sustainable at all. Um, we have agricultural land divisions that have um, been over three quarters of our residential growth in in the county. So um, over the past five plus years, if we look at our, how, our building permits that were issued, um, set over 75% of those were on five acre parcels around the county. That is otherwise land that we are losing. And so that's a very real thing and came up during our comprehensive planning process as um, a real issue and um, obviously exploring changing that acreage minimum to either increase it or um, you know shifting how our development occurs that's that's a very real thing that we're going through uh, right now i will say though that bourbon county is growing um <laughs> it's this past year it's really um it i think that the obviously when you look at the regional approach and and as we, when we did the housing study, we were looking at Lexington and some of, at the time the comprehensive plan was being updated and there was talk about, is the urban growth boundary going to expand or is it gonna remain the same? 
And a lot of that housing pressure and demand is now shifting. So, um, you know, when we talk about the one acre, the, what the perception is versus reality, when we ask the community during this housing study, like Allison said, we asked them, what, what's your ideal place to live? One acre, single family home. And again, that's not sustainable. But guess what? Our zoning code, it encourages that. So new greenfield development, um, it, it very much you know, boils down to what is attainable for developers and what is going to be, um, it, it's never easy, but what's going to be less challenging to develop. Um, and obviously you all have seen with the housing market, this is not, this, this is not even a three bedroom, two bath house that's being built on a tenth of an acre now. It's not affordable. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. So at the planning office, we focus very much on infill. And that's where it boils down to your, do we have any planners here, like municipal planners? A couple of you, yeah, yes. So in Bergen County, I mean, we have a three person office, right? So I'm the planning administrator. I'm also the floodplain manager. I'm also, yeah hazard mitigation, yada, 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 like lots of different hats. Our building inspector is also our code enforcement officer. We play so many different roles. But the great thing about being in a small community is that when a developer comes to me and they say, hey, there's this one acre lot and it's right in town and I really want to do something on it, but I don't know how to go about it. Those are the small wins that we as local planners try to take advantage of because that small one acre lot that otherwise was underutilized and potentially contaminated um, now will be a 15 unit apartment complex. You know, housing that we otherwise wouldn't have had, um, but it takes a lot of creativity, a lot of thinking outside the box and, um, and I always tell those types of developers, we need like 10 more of you to just come in and uh, restore buildings on Main Street, put in you know new housing and all of that vacant space, per, of second story space along Main Street. Um, and that is what our young professionals and people that are starting out, that, that's the type of housing that they are looking for very much. So, um, so some of the challenges, obviously I've been talking about housing, but blighted and vacant properties. Um, our code enforcement program is also pretty young. Um, while the city had a designated code enforcement officer in the past, there really wasn't a concerted effort to um, dealing with blighted, vacant, and underutilized properties. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've really started um, putting pressure on property owners to uh, fix up their properties or make a decision. You gonna do anything with it, tear it down, renovate it, um, take care of your properties. Uh, and we've had a lot of those difficult discussions um, with property owners and, uh, and so ensuring that these are being brought into the tax roll um, is something that we're working on too. Uh, so, you know, one and one last thing with the challenges I'll bring up is mindset. <laughs> so, um, you know, for Bourbon Countyans and being in, during the comprehensive planning process of which we had 30 plus meetings along with CEDIC who thankfully I mean, I can't speak enough of third-party consultants for a small community. I mean, you all keep us moving forward and, um, and help take out the, um, you know, any potential uh, bias or, you know, keep the objective decision-making uh, happening because there is a balance between um, the subjective and the objective. So we get the the impressions of the community, but then we also have to pr provide them with the data and, and challenge them to critically think about the situations that we're in. Um, so that knee jerk when a an apartment complex or an apartment building comes in, there isn't the automatic knee jerk assumption that 
oh, it's going to be such a unique dirt. You know, like there's, there's this, there is this mindset of, um, and you see it in public hearings, unfortunately, um, the, the misinformation that people live with and they, um, oftentimes it's the not in my backyard, you know, syndrome. And so shifting to a more communal mindset is something that we've really worked hard to do um, in Paris. And uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of those examples. So, uh, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, and you know, at first I, I've gotta apologize because I know that we're very much focused on conservation, but from my, from my position in Bourbon County, uh, infill development is one of the most important thing, one of the most important tools that we have to ensuring that um, we are protecting our land. So I'm going to talk to you about the example of the West Side neighborhood. Um, the West Side neighborhood is one of those segregated neighborhoods um, in Bourbon County. And two years before COVID, this uh, community group got together and decided that they wanted to change their neighborhood because they were seeing uh, increased crime, drug use. Um, the housing was very much dilapidate, dilapidated. Um, and they just, over the generations, had experienced neglect. And one of the ways that they had experienced neglect was the placement of a, um, a landfill in their neighborhood. And uh, which, up until, up until today, is no longer operates as a landfill, but still operates as a waste transfer station. Um, fortunately, we have made great strides, and based on this grassroots effort, the, um, our local decision makers, our elected officials, have made the decision to remove the waste transfer station and relocate it to another area. Um, this is another example that, geez, without third party support, um, you know, SETIC had provided support during the comprehensive planning process. Um, EHI consultant, Edward Holmes, for those of you that are familiar with him, he was instrumental in allowing our community to have the, the productive discussion alongside our elected officials. In this photo here, you might notice Matt Cook, one of our representatives, and back, um, Back behind him is one of our city commissioners, and um, of course, Ed Holmes is in the foreground. But you've got all of these community members that, um, that were there, and having a diversity of views and community leadership at the table, we are now at the point where this site is at some point in the future going to be remediated. Um, you know, we're, we're at the juncture where uh, Bluegrass Ad is now providing us with grant writing support for this site. Um, but inventorying those brownfields is one thing that we're uh, still working to obtain a map. You know, that's another thing uh, as far as mapping is concerned. Um, are those contaminated areas that need to be remediated because those could be, uh, could be uh, better utilized sites in the future. So um, the last thing that I'll leave is just um, promoting, you know, trying to get people out that silent majority. Diversity is one of the most important things. Even if your organization is advocacy focused, um, even if the conversation is contentious, uh, it is such important conversation to have. And each time we had a meeting throughout the process and we uh, noticed that there was only one side, you know, it was a very one-sided meeting, it, it was not a good meeting if that, was, if that was the case. If you're not having that um, difficult discussion, then, um, then we're not going to progress as a community. Um, so today, uh, Bourbon County in the comprehensive plan has identified that, yes, we need to look at um, land use from, uh, from the aspect of the agricultural zone and trying to um, explore in the future, you know, maybe changing those standards. But 
everything moves, you know, glacially slow. So at least we've got the fiscal court having approved our regional land use partnership, and um, and but but that's uh that's about all I have. I could go on and on. There's so many different issues that um, you know, I really. I, I love the Bourbon County community, and I think we're making great strides. And uh, and I really enjoyed the food access presentation. I, I want to talk about food in Bourbon County too, but I know that's not my role today. <laughs> so. uh, well, I am I'm so happy to be in the company of these fine women. Um, it's always great. I always learn a lot hearing from Allison, and it was great to hear from Andrea too about what's going on in Bourbon County. Um, we certainly, as many of you all, I'm sure, are intimately familiar, have a lot of controversial discussions about growth in Bay County. Um, it was mentioned many times, the, the urban services boundary. Um, so really, really happy to be here with you all. Um, Bay Alliance, for those of you who don't know, um, is a nonprofit that's dedicated to smart, equitable, and sustainable growth here in Lexington through advocacy, research, and education. So I'm going to talk to you all today about how we approach this mission, how we work for a balance between our urban areas and our um, vital, productive, and beautiful farmland. Um, and we truly have believed since we were founded in 2006 that our community success is based on that balance. Um, and I want to talk to you all today about the way we approach ensuring that we continue to have that balance and then the challenges that we face in doing so. I think a lot of which has been really, really well framed um, by Allison and by Andrea as well. So the ways that we, as I mentioned, achieve our mission are through advocacy, education, and research. So we advocate, we advocate at City Hall with our urban county council members, we advocate at the planning commission level, we advocate at the board of adjustment level, um, and we advocate for policies that are data-driven and objective to ensure that we do continue to grow in this smart, responsible, and really thoughtful way. Um, another key part of the way that we achieve our mission is education. And so I will talk a little bit about our signature educational program, Grow Smart Academy, but we have really felt that educating our community members and talking to people about why they should be invested in land use policy has been um, one of our greatest tools. You know, talking to people about why they should care about planning and zoning policy can be a challenge. Um, all the people in the room here, of course, have some sort of investment in land use policy um, but many people's eyes buzz over when we start talking about planning and zoning, which I completely <laughs> understand. Um, but we have really felt like planning and zoning policy are the building blocks, policies are the building blocks of our community. They impact the way we live, work, and play in our communities, and truly the decisions that are being made by our local officials are the ones that most directly affect the way we live every day. Um, and so educating people on these policies um, creating spaces where people can hear from local officials, from national speakers on these issues. We know that our region are, is not the only place that, that's seeing these issues. We're seeing them around the country. Um, COVID, I think, has put them in the national sphere, but we're talking a lot more about issues that we face all along. Uh, and then the third aspect of our work is research. And so I know Allison mentioned um, a few different studies that they have certainly helped Bay Alliance with and some of our other partners, State County Farm Bureau, uh, Thoroughbred Association, have all joined together um, in, in commissioning these studies. We recognized early on that we have to ensure that our education and that our advocacy is based on data, is based on um, you know, objective research that, that fuels this. We want to make sure that the policies that we're advocating for to our elected officials are based in that research. And frankly, some of the research that I'll go into in a little bit has been really transformational in, in making progress with elected officials that, that haven't, seen, ha haven't seen the full picture as we're trying to talk about it. Um, so that research, the economic research, the data research, has been really pivotal in saying to, to our elected officials, please look at this as well. There's good research behind this, and this be a part of the conversation that we're having when we think about growth and development. Uh, so when we talk about smart growth, uh, which I think we've, we've probably talked a lot and heard a lot about here today, we're really talking about you know this list is what we what we think about and what we um, move for and advocate for when we're talking about smart growth. Um, and so we think that that is um, these are the reasons why Bay County has been successful. 
Um, they're also a lot we face so many challenges around these conversations, and I think the region, um, you know, is facing these exact challenges as well. And so we have a role um, as the largest county in the region to, to be an important part of this. And so how can we encourage efficient land uses, provide housing options at all income levels, like you just heard Alex and Andrea speak about, how can we invest in our existing communities, how can we also stimulate economic development, um, but all the time maintaining that balance um, between our urban areas with the promotion of our prime farmland and our strong rural economy. So kind of as Andrea did as well, I just wanted to, to point to Lexington and successes and challenges. I think these are probably, um, you know, especially in the challenge department, similar to all the other counties in our region. Um, I do think, you know, since the institution of our urban services boundary in 1958, Lexington has, for the most part, uh, been very thoughtful and innovative about the way that we've grown um, and the policies that we've put into place to control that growth. Um, we've got a strong and diverse economy. I think as Allison mentioned before, the diversity of our economy is something we're very proud of and I think enables their success, not only in state county, but the region in general. Um, a low unemployment rate, high quality of life, significant investment in quality of life infrastructure, and we're talking about um, trails and bike head infrastructure, our downtown, but also in affordable housing, um, as well as in our local PDR program, which is the Person with Development Rights. So there is a city investment, not only in development, but in the protection of our most prime farmland as well, which ensures that we continue to have that balance. So, as I mentioned, we've got these three main pillars on which Bay Alliance has, has done its work. And I have been really thinking about it. We've been talking about um, you know, this conference in particular and the way that the work that we do um, can be thought about with, with this regional lens. Because as we know, what happens in each of our counties impacts the surrounding counties and impacts our region. And so the way that we um, you know, approach this work through advocacy, through education, and through research I think is very universal. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the ways that we're doing it in Fayette County, um, but also you know, what, what those policies look like. It, it, it's exciting to hear about what Bourbon County has been working on as well, and I know we've seen this in Clark County, and in Woodford County, and these other counties that are really looking, taking a hard look at this and saying, how can we create a structure um, to, to push this type of growth forward that is balanced, of course, with the farmland that we've been talking about today. So these are some examples um, of the advocacy efforts that, that Fate Alliance has undertaken um, in recent years as it relates to our smart growth policies. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about the growth smart strategy when we get to the research portion. Um, but a big piece of, of um, what we wanted to do as it relates to advocacy was do research that, that showed our community what opportunities we have, where our underutilized land was, and then look at what are the barriers? What are the barriers to the development that we're trying to advocate for? And identifying what those policies are and how we can begin to break down those barriers. How can we begin to cut the red tape um, to support the type of policies that enable the type of growth that we want to actually see in the community? Um, so how do we make sure that our underutilized land is better utilized? How do we incentivize development in the places where we want to see it? And a lot of this, we recognize a lot of our underutilized spaces are on our major commercial corridors. So how do we advocate for policies that enable growth on those corridors? How do we change enormous parking lots into opportunities for growth, into opportunities for housing, opportunities for mixed-use development? Um, and, and that really is what we've been focusing on since the adoption of our 2018 comprehensive plan, which is being updated uh, beginning this year as well. Um, and so part of that is, the, the next point here is the imagined Nichols for Road Land. Um, so transportation and ensuring that we begin to develop in a more transit-oriented way. Um, how do we make development more walkable? How do we prevent ourselves um, from depending on a car to get anywhere we need to go? Uh, and the way we use our land has made our community a sprawling one. Um, you know, we put ourselves in this position, and so advocating for policies like Imagine Nichols or Road, particularly in Bay County, but that of course very much impacts the other counties because that's this major corridor where people are accessing Bay County and the jobs that exist there. So Jesmond County and our other surrounding counties are, are impacted by the way and the policies that we're putting in place 
on our major Lexington corridors like Nicholasville Road. Um, so for Fate Alliance, supporting Imagine Nicholasville Road, and then continuing to support the policies that we have to see come out of that are critical, I think, to continuing to grow in a smart way. So how do we make development walkable? How do we create more <coughs> residential development that's close to our businesses, that's close to amenities? That also makes the cost of living more affordable. Um, transportation is something that often is not talked about when we're talking about affordable housing. Um, the Housing and Transportation Index is such a great resource and I've learned a lot from it. Um, you know, in Lexington, based on an, an income of $50,000 a year, transportation accounts for 24% of that. 24% is allocated to transportation. So when we're talking about affordability and affordable housing, transportation has to be a part of that. Transportation policy has to be a part of that. Otherwise, if we're building, the farther out we build, the more people work, the more people spend time, the less affordable we're making those living situations. Um, and so that's a big part of what we've been focusing on as well. Um, like I said, we have to advocate for policies that actually allow developers to build the type of development we want to see. Um, and we know that our existing zoning codes uh, create barriers to that. And that's really something that we've been working on in Fayette County. And then I think all of our communities have to work on moving forward. These zoning codes were drafted in the 50s and 60s. We know that development styles in the 80s are much different than they can and should be today. And so we've got to continually think innovatively about how to update our zoning codes to reflect the type of growth that we want to see. Um, so increasing the floor to area ratio requirements in our zoning ordinance is one way that we've done that in Bay County in the recent, um, in the recent past. So, so that was a big advocacy effort of ours, is saying how can we develop small and medium sized lots and part of that is increasing the floor to area ratio requirements. So developers can develop those middle, those excuse me, medium sized and small lots. How can we build more housing on those lots? Another big piece of that is the cost of parking. Um, and so we have been advocating for a reduction in parking requirements. Developing parking that's currently required by the zoning ordinance is an incredibly expensive piece of making a development pencil out. And so if we want to see more housing, if we want to see more housing units, have to reduce the amount of parking spaces that we're requiring for those housing units. So all of these costs that factor in are incentivized by policy. And so that's really what we're working to advocate for is breaking down these barriers, like I keep saying. Um, accessory dwelling units is another thing that we, we finally adopted. Um, I think that's been in conversation in Bay County for 10 years, um, and, and it finally was approved, which is an exciting step forward in increasing the types of housing that we allow. Um, I think both of these ladies spoke to that, that the housing stock that we have not matching what we need, and in order to decrease the cost of housing, we not only have to increase the type of supply that we have, we have to increase the, or just generally increase the supply, we have to be careful about what type of supply we're increasing and where it's happening. Um, and so ADUs are an example of how we use our existing space to increase the type of supply that's available for people at different income levels. Um, and then the last piece of advocacy I'll mention today is advocating for an annual tracking of growth and development trends. So we know, you know how much land we're using um, on, a, on a yearly basis. That's really critical to our decisions that we make about growth moving forward, is that our community is on the same page. That's been a controversial um, aspect of growth in our community, is how much land we have, how much is available for development, how much has the opportunity for development. and so having more transparency around what we have and what we're actually using, I think is going to go a long way in getting us on the same page about how we make smart growth decisions moving forward. So the next piece, and such a big piece of what we do, is education. So like I mentioned, um, our, our signature program is Grow Smart Academy, formerly called Citizens Planning Academy. Hopefully um, some, of, some of you all have attended that in the past. This is the 12th year we've done this program. We have educated close to 500 Lexington and, and beyond um, community members about smart growth. And that is a source of pride for us, because as I mentioned, I think that what's key to this work is, is talking to your neighbors and your friends and your family and your coworkers about why we should care about what decisions are getting made at City Hall today and yesterday and tomorrow. Um, and so a big part of what we do is this four-week program, and I've got to make a plug for it because it starts Tuesday, July 12th. Um, it's a free four-week course, and what we're doing is exactly what I, what I just mentioned. We're educating our community members 
on the importance of land use decisions and land use policy and how it relates to economic development, how it relates to sustainability and transportation um, and, and everything else that we're talking about here today. And, and so that is a really important part of what we do is keeping people updated about what's going on in this community, how they can get involved. Um, you know, Andrea spoke to this too, it's getting the community engagement. That's how we make strides. That's how we make progress with, as it relates to growing and continuing to grow in this smart, responsible way. Um, another piece of our educational efforts are educating our, our elected officials. We do that through research, we do that through advocacy, um, but something that, that I think has been really successful for us in Bay County, it's something we partnered and have been partnering with Bay County Farm Bureau on as well, is our Council Agriculture Day. And so how do we educate our elected officials about <coughs> the importance of something that, that they may um, you know, not know the full spectrum of? And so we join forces our organizations to take our elected officials out to see these farms, out to see this land. That's another key piece of education, is providing people the resources um, that they need to make these informed decisions. It can't be all about advocacy. Education has to be a huge part of that. Um, and then the community engagement piece as well, I know Andrea mentioned the on-the-table efforts. Hopefully some of you all participated in the Bay County on-the-table event. Um, Right now, you know, that, that event took place to provide input as it relates to our 2023 comprehensive plan. Um, and so the 2,500 survey responses that we received is, I believe, our largest data set from the community about their priorities. And I think that as those results are more widely talked about and disseminated, we are learning a lot about, I think from Beta Alliance, you know, perspective, it, it we, I think take pride in the fact that that we represent the community's priorities. So we, um, you know, have worked with third parties. We've commissioned over ten research studies in the past fifteen years, um, and you know are, are proud to be a part of that work. We partner with other organizations like Farm Bureau and KTA and others to say what what can we bring to the table that we don't have? What are these research resources that our community doesn't have that are required to make smart growth decisions? And so. Um, a few different ones I just wanted to, to touch on today. So cost of community services study. This is a, a, the cost of services is a key part of making informed decisions about growth. How much does res residential development cost mm -hmm. us? How much does commercial development cost us? We've got to know because while we are always going to need residential development, how much it costs our community and what how we balance that is key to our future growth decision. Um, and so the last community services study that was done in 2017 and I was just thinking it's the update um, that <laughs> for, for our future conversation. Oh, not yet. Um, but that study found that for every dollar of re revenue that was generated by residential development in Bay County, it cost the city $1.69. That's something that we have to be mindful. Re development does cost the city. Um, and so these pieces, these different economic pieces of research are all important when we're making these decisions. Um, this wasn't a study that we commissioned, it was actually commissioned by the left hand Board of Realtors in 2017, but another key piece, they wanted to know what are the economic impacts of our land use policy? How does the urban services boundary impact our housing prices? Um, and and I, I think this is fascinating. I think, you know, anyone, um, you know, in these conversations, I think, uh, is familiar with Lexington's urban services boundary and the common, I, I think, misperception, you know, that it, raises our housing prices. And so this study um, that the UK researchers did went directly to that. And that study found that our land use policies are not causing housing prices to rise faster than the state, um, the country, or 18 comparable cities. And that if we were to expand the urban services boundary, housing prices might increase more slowly or decrease slightly, but the effect would be temporary. This is important information for us to know as we evaluate um, expanding our urban services boundary. This isn't the end all be all of that, but I think for us all to make informed decisions about the way we're growing, we have to be clear um, in what contributes to all of these factors and how expanding and how continuing to grow and where we grow and how we grow factors into the issues we're actually trying to um, impact. Uh, and so I think that's a really important uh, piece of it as well. So another piece, um, next slide please of research that I wanted to talk about um, was the economic impact of agriculture. And of course, Allison talked about this. This was a really 
important study for us in many ways. Not only did it give you, you know, powerful statistics that you see here that Allison also mentioned, but this was transformational in the way that we talked to our elected officials about the importance of that. Um, you know, I think in many ways we can say when you're talking about an argument on anything, you know, you can look to the head and look to the heart. So in many ways we can say this land is our identity, it's our culture, it's our brand, it's what recruits people like Allison to come to central Kentucky. Um, but that's not always enough. Um, and so this question was, what, from an economic standpoint, how can we convey how important this land is to us as a community? Um, and, and this was really transformational in doing that. I mean, you know, th there are people whose, I think, minds were changed, but in addition to that, it was a new factor that they hadn't thought about in this way that impacts how we make decisions about growth. So the fact that our ag sector contributes $2.3 billion to our local economy in Bay County is significant. It is one out of every 12 jobs. It also anchors a $2 billion tourism industry and over 12,000 tourism related jobs. And so these different impacts of these research are significant. Um, and so we're always looking to figure out um, what, what's the next piece of data? What's the next piece of data that we need to have informed discussions about growth with our entire community? And then how can we educate everybody on this? Um, people that aren't directly um, you know, involved with agriculture, how do you have that conversation about, I understand that it's not your lived experience, this is how it impacts our community as a whole, has been really, really important for us. Uh, next slide, please. This is a snapshot um, of our most recent research project, which was called the Grow Smart Strategy, or the Grow Smart Plan. Um, and we really wanted to look at not only an aspect of this was an underutilized property study. So asking how much land do we have that's vacant, underused, or underutilized here in Fayette County? What land has the potential to be redeveloped? And that study found that there were over 17,000 acres of vacant, underused, and underutilized land. Um, and then the next piece was, how do we visualize that for the community? Um, how do we show the community what our growth trends are, where we're growing, how we're growing, what might make sense for the future of the way that we're growing? And so that's what, what this really goes to is, this shows in our community what the different sectors of growth are. So it might be our urban core, it might be our residential corridors, or our regional centers. And that helps to visualize for the community, where's next? Where can you expect growth? Where does it make the most sense based on that? Next slide, please. And another example, or another important piece for us was that we had to provide an illustration of what was possible. This is an example um, of, of a piece of property on the corner of Limestone and New Simple Road. And I want to be really clear that this property isn't for sale. We're not saying someone has a development plan for this right now. Um, but it was important for us to, to just to, to illustrate what could be possible. And then think about, from our perspective, how do we advocate for policies that ensure that that actually is possible? Um, and so we took this piece of property, uh, next slide please, and we reimagined it. And so keeping everything there that was already there, keeping all of the businesses there that currently exist, as well as adequate parking um, for each of those businesses, there's a possibility to create 190 housing units, 31,000 square feet of retail, and 80,000 square feet of office. Again, this is an example of what's possible, but I think that as a community, we have to be thinking innovatively. We have to be saying, what is possible and how do we get there? How do we incentivize this? Um, and the study overall found that if we utilize the land that we have and we build the types of housing that we're talking about needing, so we, uh, we get away from that mismatch of what we've got and what we actually need when it comes to housing, we could actually accommodate 30 to 40,000 housing units with the land that we have. Now, a lot has to be done for this to happen. We know that that's not going to happen overnight, and it can't be done under the ordinance as it exists today. But that's what our advocacy, education, and research efforts are striving for. This is what's possible. How do we get there? Next slide, please. I want to talk about economic development as well, because that is an important part of what we do. As Rob mentioned, it's a critical part of Bluegrass Tomorrow, um, and it's a critical part of, of all of our future. How do we continue to promote jobs? Um, not only in Fayette County, but in the region. And so that's got to be a critical part of our work as well. Um, th these go really specifically to what we look at in Fayette County. Um, but how do we are always looking at what kind of policies will activate the existing land that's available for job opportunities? What, um, what kind of policies will encourage 
and leverage the use of our existing resources? How do we leverage our landscape? How do we leverage the space that we have from vacant office space as a result of the pandemic? How do we recruit businesses based on what we have? Um, and so that, that's constantly um, something that we're always thinking about and working towards as well. Uh, next slide, please. And as we think about growth, we, we believe that growing smart and growing sustainably also means growing equitably. Um, and, and we know that our most vulnerable and historically disinvested communities deserve investment, but they also deserve investment that is community driven um, and intentional policies are required to, to prevent the type of displacement that we've seen in some of our existing communities. Land use policies are not the only policies that can correct this, but they're absolutely necessary. And in addition to our land use policies, our communities have to come together to say, how do we work towards preventing this? And I think those policies and what we've seen in our community is that those policies have to come from the neighborhoods that are being impacted. Many times, and I think this is probably true throughout the community, the solutions um, are often held with people that are most impacted by these issues. Um, and so Lexington in particular instituted the Neighborhoods and Transition Task Force, um, as well as the Mayor's Task Force on Racial Justice, uh, one subcommittee of which was specifically dedicated to um, housing and gentrification. And so there have been recommendations that are issued. We constantly need to be working towards implementing those recommendations, but also talking to additional community members who can weigh in on these issues. Because we can't talk about growth without talking about the inequities of growth, who has been impacted historically by those inequities, and how we can continue to prevent and mitigate those types of inequities and displacement as we move forward, um, I think, for, for all of our future. Next slide, please. And just lastly, the question for Bay Alliance, and I think all of us here in the room, is not if we're going to grow, but how we're going to grow. And that's what we always try to come back to, that it's the way that we grow um, that is the most impactful. And so from a Bay Alliance perspective, we have really um, worked to advocate, educate, and research on all the issues that I talked about today and create data-driven solutions since we were founded in 2006. Um, I think Conversations about growth can often be polarizing, um, as many of us know from, from prior experience. And I think that the key to making these informed decisions is, is what we're all talking about here today. Is there data? Is there research? Where, where's the community engagement? How can all of these pieces fit together um, in the bigger picture so that the community decisions that we're making in Bay County, or Bergen County, or Judson County, or Scott County, or any of the surrounding counties, how can we continue to keep the lines of communication open and work toward uh, responsible, equitable, and sustainable growth for all of us. So thank you all.